And we're going to jump right into it. If you have your paper and pencil, have your paper horizontal. And you notice on the, uh, on the right-hand side of my paper, I have a dot here. Uh, that's where I'd like you to place your dot, your starting point. And um, don't worry about it being higher or lower too much. Just, uh, just kind of roughly towards the center there. And what we're going to do is we're just going to make a, a big letter C shape that comes in like this. And then around like this. And comes over like that. Right to the edge. Once you have that letter C shape, I'd like you to just draw a line that comes down here like that. And then copy that line you have above by curving around like this until you come up to the edge and stop there. What we're drawing is a shape that started out looking like a kind of a potato when we added this extra line it flattened it out like a potato pancake. Uh, what we're going to do is make a stack of them like this, one after another, come around like this. Next one, make a little skinnier, about like that. Another one, maybe a little bit wider, coming down here. We're going to bring it all the way down until you get to a layer that brings you right off to the edge here. So we got this, this shape that's really close to us. In fact, I'm going to take one more here just to bring it right off the bottom of the page so it looks like it's really close to us. So we got a big stack of pancakes. Actually, they are um, blueberry pancakes. For a moment anyway, I'd like you to draw some little shapes like these along the side. These are called inclusions. And uh, what we're actually drawing is a rock that is made up of layers of sediment that have fused together over a great period of time. And within these layers, uh, different uh, objects, uh, different organisms that live there have remains that have been collected or gathered in those layers. And each layer is kind of a glimpse of a certain period in time and uh, give us a, a, a view of the neighborhood, a view of the neighbors that occupied that, uh, that time period in our Great Lakes region. Uh, these are sedimentary layers uh, as a limestone and uh, something that up in Leelanau County here we have a whole lot of in the northern part of the peninsula and is used for um, making roadways and it's very important uh, in industry because lime is also used, limestone is also used as a flux stone in creating steel out of iron or along with iron ore. So it's been a, a, a resource, a great resource for people in, uh, in you know, early settlement in the Michigan and, and um, in the rise of our industry. Um, to make this look more interesting and more solid like a rock, what I'd like you to do is come over here to the left-hand side and just copy that first line we drew down and make a bunch of lines like this. We're going to set a mood here by making it look like this rock, this side of the rock is in shadow. By darkening this in and going around your inclusion there, that little object, that ancient organism, uh, you can spread them further apart as you come over to the right. Maybe there's a light source over here. I want to make it look darker here and do this layer like this. And each of these layers has its own sediment that was formed. Sometimes uh, it's very similar in nature. Sometimes it's different. Maybe this uh, ocean was close to uh, where these rocks were, were formed, uh, ancient sediment, uh, near a, uh, an estuary that flooded out some different soil into the ocean that settled on top of earlier rocks. So just draw lines like this. It'd be a darker soil here that became a different form and then more here like this. And just make it look like, look like it's uh, a bunch of layers. And within these we have these objects trapped. And these might be little bits and pieces of strange creatures called trilobites, mucrospirifers, uh, brachiopods, uh, cephalopods, shells, and lots of different things that live back in this day. One of my favorite things is going to be the main character of this is a shape that looks kind of like an egg. It's a little wider in the front, mainly because the, the rock is tilted towards us a little bit and back, but also because the head shape is a little bit bigger than the, than the tail shape. And this animal is uh, is known as a trilobite, and it comes in all different sizes. As some of the smallest ones are an eighth inch or so, and some of them could be like twenty some inches. Uh, and they are um, they, but they all have several ingredients that are very similar. Uh, they have a head, and we'll draw that in the forward area here, the larger area. And they have a tail back here. So I'm drawing these two curves. Notice this one's larger, this one's smaller. Uh, the head has many different varieties of shapes, but the one we're going to draw has a shape coming back like this and back like this. 
and the tail is going to have a shape like that. The head is called the cephalon, and it's uh, it's got a, uh, a kind of a cool sounding name. The pagidium back here, the tail, uh, actually has a bunch of little marks on it like this, showing that it was once made up of sections that eventually fused together. And you'll see those in a minute. And the middle part of this animal is where it gets its name. Uh, it has three sections here. Each one of these is considered a lobe, a trilobite, a three-lobed. Three is Latin for, or tri is Latin for three, and then each one's a lobe and an ite is an organism. So you can have these lines. And just, I took these bumps this way coming over, and these little, this is sort of like clouds and waves down here. I'm just going to draw these lines here. If it ends up looking crooked or off, don't worry about it. It's very tough for an organism to become a fossil. Everything's got to be just right. Usually you find bits and pieces, like over here, for instance, there's a little a segment of one of those pieces there. Sometimes just a fragment of a pagidium here would be found, or, or just a little tip of the wing-like protrusion here on the edge of the head. Um, all this debris, is, these are this is a, what's called an assemblage, where you have bits and pieces of things mixed in with, with full objects like that, and parts of other organisms too. So we'll be developing that further. Um, what I'd like you to do now is take each of these and draw a line like this coming over. And, and when you do this, don't try to get them perfect. These are the areas that will shift and twist back and forth. Maybe there's a gap in there like that. It's really tough for an animal to become a fossil in the first place. Uh, it's even harder to become a perfect fossil. Uh, think of shifting sands and, and uh, currents that will dis disperse the parts of the pieces as the tissues that hold them together um, to begin to disintegrate. And then draw these little curves like this, coming up to put a little shadow on this side here, maybe a little shadow along here, just to add some more dimension to it. A little line there. So we have a three-lobed organism called a trilobite. Its head, the cephalon, is made up of several parts. Right here, I'm going to draw this big shape, bulbous-looking letter C shape here coming around. The eye of this animal is right here. I'm going to draw one here like this. It's partly covered up by that nose-like shape. And then the other one over here like this. In early days, trilobites had a very tiny opening, a single a single photo cell, maybe enough to alert it if a shadow was to pass over that would cause it to roll into a tight little ball. That's why this body is so flexible, so it can roll up like a roly-poly or a pill bug. By the time we get to this particular one or this particular group of trilobites, um, the eyes have changed. They now have many lenses, like the eyes of a dragonfly. And that would add greatly to their survival skills. They were very, very long surviving species um, in in uh, the ancient history of our prehistory of our oceans. Um, you have uh, facial sutures here. There's a line that comes around here like this, comes back and around. One of my favorite trilobites is uh, one known as the flexum, flexamidi calamiki miki. And uh, flexicalamini miki miki. And it is a... Uh, uh, one that looks very similar to this. It was kind of a generic trilobite. But I'm going to draw some curvy lines here just to make it look more round and bulbous. And then uh, up in here, if you want to add a little curve here and here, it makes it look almost like it's a little smiley character. These eyes are built up on bezel-like platforms, kind of like, uh, like stones on a ring. And in this uh, surrounding rock, we're going to add a bunch of leftovers here. I'd like you to draw a little horizontal shape with a with a little dash in the center there, so it looks like a donut, leftover donuts. Some of them are so small you hardly even see the dot. Some of them are just dots themselves. These are all parts of animals that grew nearby, and uh, we'll put those animals together in a few minutes as we bring these inanimate rock objects of ours to life in the back portion of our drawing. Um, but we've got a ways to go before we get there. I'd like you to. Uh, keep adding these little parts. Here's a piece of broken shell here from something. Here's another. Um, here's a piece of, uh, yeah, here's a piece of coral. This is a particular kind of coral that is still with us today in a similar form. And we might have different pieces of this here, like, like that. And then you also have a bunch of little lines like these scattered about. 
And uh, somewhere in here, usually it's done on the side or off in the way. I'd, I'm going to write. Uh, I'm going to write a number here. This is. Um, uh, I'd like to use today's date. And we're going to do a twenty for 2020, and I'm going to put uh, a four and a one here. If you're drawing this at a different time, uh, just think of the the letter, for, the number for the month, and then the day. And I'm going to put a four and a one. So. And then this is number one. Uh, this is the first fossil I found today. I went around the other side of that. Uh, this fossil would be marked, identified with a, a number series um, that could be linked to a page in a book. And that book is going to be right down here like this. We're just going to draw a line like that. And I think I'll take this one right off the bottom of the page, too. It'll free up some more space up above. I'm going to draw two lines parallel. And they're kind of wiggly. They're kind of ragged. And draw a couple li wiggly lines down here, one and then draw a line that comes over here. I'm going to put a little break in it and come back like that. This little break is going to make it look kind of dog-eared, like a book that's been carried around for some time. You have pages in here. Draw some light, wiggly lines in here. Makes it look like this book maybe fell down into the bottom of the canoe when you were uh, paddling to some some special place to look for fossils, or maybe it got left on a left on a stump somewhere and it got wet. Um, I'd like you to draw some spiral rings like this and think of the the dollar store version notebooks, little pocket notebooks. This might be all you need to be able to catch your ideas and document them. Uh, and this is what's called your fossil log. I'm going to write here F-O-S-S-I-L. Notice I'm copying the angle of the book here. And these vertical lines are kind of copying this edge. Maybe could have done a little closer than that. And then log, L-O-G. It's like a ship's log. as a ship moves along, the cabin enters, uh, changes in course and and uh, discoveries and things along the way. And that's that's where somewhere in this book, this number here will be entered in. And, uh, and uh, as many pages as necessary will describe the rock, describe the location of it, where it was found, the surrounding or matrix rock, uh, maybe even a map to guide someone back to it or to share it with other, other paleontologists, science, uh, rock scientists, ancient life scientists. And then, um, and then the next step is to go to the libraries and uh, do the research that's necessary to bring a greater understanding, a deeper understanding of this particular fossil to find out if it's one that is already known. Or, or maybe you're fortunate enough to discover a species of your own. And at that point, your fossil will likely be named after you. Uh, I mentioned uh, Flexicalamidae Miki Miki. A man named Miki was the one who identified this, a scientist. And and then he found a different variation of it, so he got his add, a name added to that again. So if you're going to a library, and that's what I did. I drew two parallel lines here. I added a third one close together. And I'm making this look like one of the old-time books you find in a, in a science library, like uh, where I grew up in the University of Michigan. They have libraries in the, in the, uh, in the uh, museum down there, the Natural History Museum. They have cabinets and books and all kinds of things that, that will give you an idea, uh, the knowledge you need to know more about these things you're discovering or finding. It's a personal discovery if it's the first time you found it, and uh, maybe you get a clue that might help you when you're looking at those thousands of books to just see a little shape like this on the binding of the book, maybe embossed into it. It has a couple lines here like that and a couple lines here and two dots for eyes. And it might be right here the... Uh, We'll just write, um, I'm just going to write uh, fossils of, and it might be fossils of Michigan, fossils of the Great Lakes, or you can think of whatever title you want for it. It might be all about trilobites. And to make this stand out a little bit, we're going to use a texture kind of like this one here. I'm just going to pick an angle shape like this that's going to... Uh, put a shadow on this side of the book, and you'll see why in a minute. I just want to shadow this in. And then you can, in the this little pinch between the spine and the binders, uh, the, uh, you can darken that in a little bit. And if you want to make this look more rounded, you can add a few lines like these, just to make it look like a leather-bound book, something that has a lot of knowledge and wisdom in it to guide you on your way. So somewhere in here you have this this number written down in your fossil logbook. 
Uh, by the time you go to the library, you might have found all kinds of rocks like this, and you might have filled a big box that weighs 50 pounds. It's a lot easier to study and explore in the library if you take this little book that weighs a matter of ounces to the library, and you have all the information documented in it that will make it easier to, uh, to look up things and so, um, save some time and, and uh, some backbone. What we're going to do here is we're going to take a line that comes up like this, and we're just going to come across. If you've drawn with me in the past, you know I like doing these wiggle borders, kind of like Bob Ross cleaning his paintbrushes. Uh, these these uh, borders are a great way to take something, in this case, take something that's dead and inanimate, meaning this rock, which was uh, uh, the last vestiges of a representation of long-ago life, and to... Um, bring it to life in the picture we're drawing as we look at the ancient seas where these animals, this animal and these other creatures thrive. I'm going to start right here and come up a little bit and I'll put a border along here, kind of copying the upside edge, ignoring the, uh, the tears and tatters and just coming down here like this. This will frame in our future masterpiece so everybody will know it's really serious stuff and come along like this until you bump into something here. It also gives us a place we might add some more information, some written information for our drawing. Um, the next thing I want to do is um, I want to come in here and um, I think what I'll do is I'll start with a coral reef over here. Just draw a ragged, bumpy looking line and just kind of bring it down like that. Every time I do a drawing like this, and this is probably the 400th, maybe more than that drawing I've done of this basic theme. Um, I change it up. I, I move things around. I mess around with it. I, it gives me different ideas and different ways of uh, introducing things that need to be in here. Um, what I want to do is bring a, a shape here that, uh, that you're familiar with from oceans today. This is an animal that still lives today. And I'm going to draw another leg coming over here. And so you see we have a, a sea star, a starfish. I'm going to draw some little textures in here. And um, I'm going to draw a, a bunch of lines coming up over the top here like this, little dots. So we see it crawling over the top of this, this reef. Um, some time ago I drew some drawings, of, well, I often draw drawings of underwater pictures of life today, and I have uh, a lot of pictures that have starfish like this that come in all different sizes. And they generally have five legs like this. You also have uh, you also have uh, other different forms of starfish. These are echinoderms. Their stomach is located right in there. The mouth is located right in the center, and it goes directly into the stomach. And they graze along these sides of reefs or across sand flats, and and they gather up the food that they want and just take it pretty much right to their mouths. Uh, along in here, I'd like you to draw some sea urchins. We can draw these as little bumps. I'm going to put one down here so we can start out close up and draw spines sticking out like these. These are animals that are living today, uh, virtually the same, minor, minor variations maybe, but virtually the same as they did long ago. We have starfish and we have, uh, we have sea urchins. So maybe over here, some of these little lines that stick out like this and this, these might be the spines of sea urchins. Uh, maybe over here, maybe this right here, if I add a little bump there, that could be a fragment of a leg from one of the starfish. And you find this little bit and piece here with this main specimen, just giving us an idea of um, where this animal lived and what its neighborhood was like. The main character of this large drawing of ours is not going to be the trilobite. The trilobite in this picture is going to be quite small. I'm going to draw a little shape like that. You have another one here, and there's different ones that lived at different times, but we can think of different shapes and sizes of trilobites and, and, uh, and draw them in here and think of the ancient Devonian oceans of the Great Lakes. And then just figure out which end is which if you want to make this end the head and put eyes on it and lines there like that, or this one here could be going the other way. And um, they, they have an interesting way of eating. They have a, uh, they kind of, they're also, they go right from, right from the ground to their mouth, but as they're walking along, they leave a trail like this, and they, um, they basically pull the food to their mouth and, 
as they move along, as they're constantly grazing, just like the, um, uh, not just like, but similar to the starfish. And they, they're eating bits and pieces of organic debris uh, that have settled onto the floor of the ocean. And apparently there was a lot of that debris to eat because this was a long-lasting, thriving species for a long, long time. Um, in this ocean, you also have these graceful plant-like stems rising up like this. So it's getting skinnier as it comes up to the top. At the top, it has a kind of a armored shell. They look kind of like petals sticking out like this. And then uh, coming up from those, you might have others like this. This is called a crinoid, and this crinoid stem is like a sea lily. It, it's made up of little round donut shapes stacked one on top of the other. They're held together by a thin layer of tissue along the outside and also along the tube on the inside. And they are articulate, they move in such a way that they kind of bend with the flow of the ocean, the currents of the ocean. And um, that's where we get these little donut shapes that we have trapped in our assemblage here, our, our fossil along with the trilobite. Up here there are tendrils reaching up like this, and these are also made out of those tiny, tiny little donut shapes. And you have small spines like these sticking out, which act as kind of a catch basket for uh, organic matter that's drifting in the current of the ocean. And the food will be grabbed by these, it's like a fishing net, it'll grab it and uh, it flows right down into the mouth of this animal and down this long tube. Uh, where it's excreted. Um, you also have animals that look different than this. You have uh, animals called graptolites, and they come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. And here's one. It has a shape that comes up like that, and it has a little horn-like shape sticking up here and down. I cannot recall the name of this one. Now I've got to go back to the museum and, and do some checking or go to the library. But it has this one section like that, and it has a bunch of little marks like this on it, just kind of suggest a, a different form to it. You have others that grow up like this here. I'm going to carry this one up behind like that. And it's got a, a head on top like this. And it's another form of graptolite. It's going to come down and around and then back like that. And um, it has a couple little arm-like tendrils that reach out like this and it has a different shape or a pattern to its to its head and body like that but all of these are made up basically of structures they have the similar kind of a, a similar kind of a stem to them um, might be closer or smaller and and they make their living uh, pretty much anchored though the graptolites could also move some of them had uh, tails that could get, get grab onto something and then move as they needed to, um, just wisping their tail-like stem in the, uh, in the water to get where they're going. You also have things like this. You also have plants growing. And um, some of these plants, like seaweed, like this, you just draw some lines back and forth, and others like this. Just wiggle up and then down like this and twist it back and forth like that. It makes it look like graceful seaweed flowing in the current. And... Uh, if you turn it sideways, this is a great way to draw flags flying from the mass of a pirate ship, twisting and blowing in the wind. Main character of our story in this drawing is going to start up here like this. It's going to be coming down here, and this is a guy who could grow quite large. You find a lot of fossils of these characters in gift shops nowadays. They're finding many in Morocco, and, and they're often in black matrix rock or surrounding rock and they stand out with almost ghost-like white images against it. Some of them are very small and some of them could be very large. And along the sides here we're just going to draw some marks that not only show the roundness of this animal but they stand for the sutures or the separations or the growth marks that are left as this animal goes from something quite small to something quite large. And as it does it needs more room and it just creates a bigger shell. Um, there are different patterns on this, on these shells, probably to help it camouflage itself 
in the reef and, um, and you can just draw patterns maybe on top like this I'm just drawing like scrambled egg patterns kind of little squiggly lines like that and then underneath to make it look more rounded like the Sun is coming down from the surface here we'll draw some lines coming up like this and if you leave a little light we call this edge lighting here along the bottom just draw curves that kind of flip up like the uh, the shape of the big curves that show the sutures or the sections it makes it kind of glow and shimmer it's a great way if you're drawing action characters and and heavy metal machinery to get that extra extra kind of kick to the edges there this animal has a, a hat like shape up here which is called a mantle it comes down and we'll just kind of curve it down like that and up and around like this and I'll bring it right back up here so it looks like an eye actually a string and a balloon on the end here flying along we don't know exactly what the shape of the pupil of the eye looks like in this animal but um, we can look at animals alive today that are similar to it and get an idea of what it might have looked like. Maybe it's a vertical slit like this or a horizontal slit like that. Um, depends. You look at an octopus, a squid. Um, those are two animals that are uh, that are similar to this, though not directly related. And then you have a pattern on this mantle. And I'm just going to kind of follow along here with some dots like that. Maybe do that again just to make it look fancy. Nowadays, squid don't have shells like this. They don't need them. They can put on light shows and they can morph into different different shapes and move very quickly. And octopus is like this. The octopus doesn't have a shell anymore um, or never had a shell as an octopus. But um, the, uh, the other parts of this animal are very much like an octopus. Draw two wiggly lines coming out here and make them wiggle up and over. And I'd like you to take these strand-like shapes and turn them into tentacles by starting out at the tips and then widening them out as they come back in towards the face of this animal. This animal is called a cephalopod. If you translate that, cephalo is more Latin for head and pod is foot, so technically it's a head foot. Um, it just means that it makes its living pretty much hand to mouth or tentacle to mouth in this case, perhaps that sea urchin is on the menu. You can add other tendrils or tentacles, excuse me, coming back like this and out. And maybe put suckers on them, just like we have on octopus, the ones from the back there. You'll see those maybe along the edges of these front ones. I'm going to put a shadow here from the mantle where it overlaps the tentacle area. And then up in here, I'm just going to draw this around and put some little marks here and show the, suggest a pattern on these. If you draw little lines underneath here, it adds a little more dimension to the tentacles and even down in here where it tucks under you can darken those in a little bit. The eye itself might have a reflection line on it or a shadow over here but that is uh, that's basically what these guys look like. Again some of them are small there's a, apparently there was a shell of an animal like this that was found somewhere along Lake Erie uh, that is in the or in Pennsylvania area actually that is uh, seven eight feet long in Morocco they have fossils of creatures like this that are in the 20 30 feet long range so this guy could be quite large I guess um, what we're going to do next is come up here and we'll draw a, an animal that is really uh, pretty pretty interesting because at this time all of the animals that we have here are invertebrate. There's no vertebrate animals whatsoever until we get to this guy here. And he's going to start out with a line that comes up like this. He's going to curve up and over and then down like this and back and right about to there. Right here there's a spine that sticks up, comes back like that and then down. Right here, there's one that comes out to the side and down a little bit, comes up like that. So it actually looks kind of like a fish. If you put an eye up here, it looks pretty interesting. Draw a little curve here. This, the head of this animal is made up of bony plates, and they all fuse together, and they make a shape that, that looks very much like a fish head today, but it's, um, it's not. It's, uh, it's quite different. You have a belly that comes up here like this, and I'm going to carry it right back behind this seaweed here. Yours may be in a different place. And I'm going to bring this line here down, and I'm going to make it, I'm going to draw dashed lines like these. I'm going to have 
we have several areas here. We can have four at least those spines coming out. And then the tail I'll bring up here like this. Usually I don't mix it in like this so much, but it just kind of worked out that way. You see the tail in this fish-like shape swimming up. I say fish-like because it's um, it, it has a strong resemblance to a fish, but we're going to look at some of the differences. Um, first of all, um, this fin here is fused into the head bones of this fish, and we're going to draw a line that comes down here, and so is this fin right here, or this, not fin, these are spines actually, and if you draw a little line along in here, you can put a, a shape that comes over like that. Looks kind of like it has a mouth, but actually this animal only has a little hole in the end of its nose here. It makes its living pretty much as a, an underwater vacuum. It just uh, sucking up pieces of debris uh, that are floating in the surface or floating in the water. Uh, down here you have several spines sticking up, and these would be protective in a way, but there's no web, no fin connecting them together. Um, that would be some time, some long time coming before that would happen. But each of these was attached to the backbone, the, the spine of this fish, which allows its body to move in a very flexible way. Um, we don't know exactly what color this animal was. We do know that it had scales, though. And the scales uh, are sometimes seen as very large like this and sometimes small. I've seen and just as it changed over time. But I'm going to draw these little C shapes in here. The same shape, remember that C we started out with here over on our trilobite fossil there? Such a useful shape if we're drawing things like this in the ocean. Uh, the scales come right up to the tail here. They go right out to the end. There's no fin on the tail. It's just an extended piece of muscle and, and tissue that um, uh, is like an extension of the body. Its swimming technique must have been pretty wild, pretty thrashy, moving its body back and forth and wiggling its way around. And it would probably find itself uh, in, in a feasting area when this animal is eating, because this one would be a pretty sloppy eater and there'd be debris uh, floating around through the water. You might have a whole school of these small fish swimming about. He looks very large here because he's close to us, but we're going to keep him kind of small. And then, and then you could draw another one back in here, just take that same basic shape and draw a body that comes like that and up like that. And you can see you might have one that uh, is very similar to this one and a spine sticking out there and an eye. Again, this is a, a vertebrate animal, so it has vertebrae just like we do. And in this ocean scene, in this ocean environment, there was nothing up to this time that had vertebrae uh, in their structure. This is a uh, cephalopod has no bone structure at all. These are all exoskeletons and and uh, same thing with the uh, trilobite. It has an outer armor for a skeleton and the muscles are attached to the inside of it like <coughs> excuse me. In this drawing I'd like to um, I'd like to go a little bit further in, in developing this ocean environment. We're going to uh, start up here like this and carry a line out just to show uh, a big part of this is the reef building capacity of this coral reef. And uh, what we'll do is come back like this here and then come out again like this and then come back like this and bring it over to it bumps into this rock. To make it look like an ancient coral reef just plunge lines down to the depths of the ocean from each of these marks and you see this see this uh, illusion of depth developing in our drawing here. You know, one like that. To make it stand out more, to make it look deeper, darker down in here, to make that book stand out, draw some layers of sediment that are fusing into rock over time. Maybe this is coral, maybe it's sand, sandstone. And just kind of imagine this, this uh, chasm here between the coral reef and this other land in the background. In this area here, uh, I talk about a coral reef, but it doesn't look like one yet. What I'd like you to do is, around this trilobite, just start drawing little shapes like this, or little spiral shapes, or just wiggles like that. And think of many different kinds of corals. As during this time, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a uh, uh, not only the trilobites, but we have our Petoskey stone coral, and we'll see those corals growing in clusters and clumps. 
along with other corals. And so draw some shapes like this, just kind of scribbling them in. Another thing you're going to find down here is uh, 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 solitary corals like this one here that come up. And corals are interesting because they have tendrils that reach up around that mouth area like this. And they their body is built more like this here. You also have sponges and other animals like that growing up. So draw some solitary corals here. Now the rest of them are what are called colony corals that are all gathered together in clusters and they're constantly battling one another for turf, for territory. In this area, we have our Petoskey stone, Hexagonaria, and we also have uh, we also have other other corals that uh, it was battling against. And you find um, you find these corals all around the shores of Michigan here in the summertime. Um, in the background or back in here, I'm just going to add some more details like this coming out, and in here, and coming out this way. And down here, I'd like you to sign your name. I'm just going to put my name right here, like this. There, are, If you have open areas like this, you can go ahead and add all kinds of these cephalopods. Uh, I should add this now, just to show you here. There's There are some, some of these cephalopods that have curves to their bodies, like this. And um, kind of like that. And there are others that are long and straight. Others eventually curled up like this, and to structure more recognizable as a as a nautilus only this is more like a well this is more like a nautilus it's actually different but uh, they had ammonites as well back in here even some ripples to show the water or the flow of the water as this animal is swimming through it um, but think of colors that you can add to it um, this is uh, ancient life of the Great Lakes, and uh, this is the Paleozoic era. Uh, the ancient Paleo, I'll put up here, Paleo, P-A-L-E-O-Z-O-I-C. I'm going to write Paleozoic Seas of Michigan.